In general, cabbage has been shown with fewer revascularizations later on compared to PCI. However, with incremental advances in stent technology, is that still an accurate statement? So, there is a presentation here at this meeting and then simultaneously published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and I am talking with uh, the author of that, Sri Paul Bangalore, who is an MD and Director of Research and the Cardiac Catheterization Laboratory and Director of Cardiovascular Outcomes Group at uh, Owen, oh, an Associate Professor of Medicine, New York University School of Medicine. Everolema saluting stents or bypass surgery for multivessel coronary disease. This was a registry uh, study, if I remember right. That's so correct. what were you looking at specifically? Right. So the basic reason to do this is, uh, as you were pointing out, if you look at prior randomized trials, there is a signal, or at least in a couple of trials, that there is a signal that bypass surgery is associated with better mortality when compared to PCI. And we saw that in the FREEDOM trial, in the longer term results of the SYNTAX trial, bypass actually had a mortality benefit. But all of them compared bypass with first generation stents. And we know from plenty of data that the second generation stents are far superior to first generation. So we wanted to see uh, the outcomes uh, if you were to compare with second generation stents, and that's the reason we did the study. Now, in this particular analysis, what did you learn? What's yeah. new and exciting? Yeah, so a couple of things. So what we did was uh, we had over 18,000 patients, so a large number of patients. And this large number of patients is especially important because we can actually look at individual endpoints. So historically, what clinical trials have done is to use composite endpoints. And composite endpoints are great for clinical trials because it makes the sample size smaller, we can do the trials easily. But in clinical practice, we don't use composite endpoints. We don't tell our patients, by the way, your risk of this bunch of events is reduced. I mean, they don't, right. care, they don't understand what, what it means. So I think in clinical practice, we look at individual endpoints. I mean, we tell the patient, your risk of death is this, your risk of MI is this. But clinical trials have never been powered. So here we had a unique opportunity to look at 18,000 patients and say, what are the individual endpoint difference between bypass and the latest generation stents? And the results are very interesting. And it actually is very similar to a ra small randomized trial which is uh, presented at ACC. Uh, what we found was for death, there was no difference between bypass surgery and stenting. And the same was seen in the BEST trial, so no difference. And I think that itself is very interesting uh, because of the signal we have seen in prior randomized trials favoring bypass. For MI, we showed that there was uh, increase in MI with using stenting compared to cabbage. But this increase in MI um, was not seen if patient had complete revascularization in the PCI group. So there is an increase in MI, but complete, if you revascularize, if you, had, if you were to completely revascularize, no more differences in MI. BEST trial also showed increase in MI with the uh, Everolimus saluting stent, but they didn't do this additional analysis of looking at completeness of revasc. Um, the third thing was repeat revascularization. Both the studies show that there is increase in repeat revascularization with PCI, but we did an interesting analysis. So there have been multiple publications from the New York State Registry, and many of them have been published in the New England Journal in the last couple of decades. And we show a considerable improvement in stent technology in the rate of repeat revascularization from the balloon angioplasty era, bare metal stent, drug eluding stent, and with the latest generation stent. So we show this, there is an incremental improvement. And finally, for stroke, we showed that there is increase in risk of stroke with bypass, and which has been shown in every other study. For whatever reason, BEST trial did not show a difference, but BEST trial is very underpowered to actually look at any kind of event. And the last thing I must say is also we looked at short-term outcomes, and we found that bypass surgery was associated with increasing the risk of death and stroke at 30 days, which has also been shown in prior studies. Now, in an accompanying commentary, Bob uh, Harrington emphasized that there are still, these are still observational studies, and so that needs to be taken right, right up front. You did some real uh, sophisticated analyses. With all the sophisticated statistics that now can go along with this, are we getting closer to where it's not randomized trial, but it's superior to what we used to know as just an observational study? Yeah, so I think the way I look at it is, uh, you know, both randomized trial and observation studies have their pluses and minuses. You know, randomized trials are the gold standard. I don't think we can ever replace that. But also we have to be very aware that there are good randomized trials, there are bad randomized trials, and 
if the sample size attained is considerably smaller than what it was powered for, you're going to have a very underpowered study. And that randomized trial is becoming, it becomes as problematic as any other data out there. Observation studies have advantages, and with using sophisticated techniques, we can, uh, we can adjust for baseline confounders just as we did, but we can be powered for individual outcomes. But I think uh, the, the, my take home for all of this is you need to consider the totality of evidence. We need to look at observation studies, we look at randomized trial, and based on everything, we need to make a decision uh, as to what does the data shows. You're correct, and that's exactly what uh, Bob Harrington pointed out. He wrote in his commentary, there are clearly trade-offs between these two revascularization strategies that need to be discussed with the patients and part of the shared decision-making yeah. that is recommended yeah. always by the guidelines. Yeah. I think that's the critical thing to emphasize, and the reason I say that is, if there is a mortality difference, no, mortality trumps everything, you know. If there is a mortality difference, everybody should be going for bypass. So now we are saying, both from our study and the best study, there is no mortality difference. So mortality advantage of bypass is off the table. Now it should be a discussion between patients and physicians that there are trade-offs, as you said, with bypass surgery, upfront risk of death and stroke, and with uh, PCI, upfront, I mean, long-term risk of repeat revascularization and possibly increased risk of MI if you cannot completely revascularize. So, you know, patients have different opinions. I mean, there are some patients who do not want to have a stroke, regardless of how small the risk is. And there are some patients who do not want to come back for repeat procedures. So I think it becomes a, a shared decision making at the end of it. Now this is simultaneously published on the New England Journal of Medicine website. So there will be, by the uh, time you see this, there should be a citation at the very end, right after I say, I'm Rick McGuire for CardioSource World News, where I'm executive editor.